and welcome once again everyone into my study here in the manse it's good to be with you i don't know what the weather's been like where you are but here in the north yorkshire dales boy we've had a bit of a cold snap we even had a little bit of kind of sleety snow stuff which seems really weird to me especially as we're almost into may but that's what we've got to put up with so nothing we can do about it so i hope you're okay and hopefully you're getting out and about a little bit more as our restrictions are easing so we're going to turn to this week's reflection when we say things like they were a true friend or they were a true fan what is it that we mean the word true is an interesting one isn't it for instance a true story would be an accurate story a true depiction of something would be telling it like it is as it really happened it would be literal and verifiable if you needed a piece of wood to be true this would entail a process to ensure that it was straight so no crooked edges but also no flaws either attach that understanding to the phrase a true friend and we think of loyal trustworthy faithful devoted for me the gospel passage set for sunday the 2nd of may is very much about what it means to be a true disciple of jesus for surely only true disciples can produce bountiful harvests so let's now take a look at John chapter 15 verses 1 to 8. So if you have your Bible there, open it with me to the Gospel of John, the last of the four Gospels at the beginning of the New Testament. John chapter 15 verses 1 to 8. And this week I am reading from the New Revised standard version of the bible so see how it compares to whatever version you are using i am the true vine and my father is the vine grower he removes every branch in me that bears no fruit every branch that bears fruit he prunes to make it bear more fruit you have already been cleansed by the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me as I abide in you. Just as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Those who abide in me and I in them bear much fruit, because apart from me you can do nothing. Whoever does not abide in me is thrown away like a branch and withers. Such branches are gathered, thrown into the fire and burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask for whatever you wish and it will be done for you. My Father is glorified by this, that you bear much fruit and become my disciples. So I expect you instantly recognised that passage. It is a well-known Bible reading with the words tripping off the tongue. But our first task is to put it into its context. For we may have moved on from Maundy Thursday and indeed been through Easter and out the other side. But here in this passage, we are back in the upper room 
on the evening that we know as the Last Supper. So let's put ourselves back there. It is before the arrest of Jesus. It is before Peter has denied Jesus. Before the crucifixion. Before the resurrection. Jesus has enjoyed a Passover meal with his disciples. This has been friends together, reclining at the table. Judas, we note, has already left and Jesus has continued to speak to the remainder of his disciples. His last words at the very end of chapter 14 are this. Rise, let us be on our way. But surprisingly, nobody moves. Maybe they were enjoying Jesus's company too much. Maybe they were just comfortable after a good meal and a belly full of wine. Whatever the reason, nobody gets up to leave. So Jesus continues to talk. He begins with, I am the true vine. Why he suddenly uses this picture to try and explain the relationship between himself, God the Father and them, we do not know. Perhaps something caught his eye. Could he see through a window or an open door to a vineyard up on the fertile slopes? Maybe there was just a bunch of grapes on the table. Or was it simply because he knew that Judas had left to betray him, that he knew Judas was not a true disciple, not loyal, not faithful, not devoted, not trustworthy. Something triggered this image. And so rather than leave the upper room, he continues to teach his disciples who had become his close friends. And they hang on his every word. For us, as we think about this passage, there are five points to notice. Point one is that Jesus is the authentic vine. The vine was frequently used in the Old Testament as a symbol of God's people and it often depicted their failure and inability to live up to all that God expected of them. Where Israel had failed, Jesus has succeeded. This is the last time Jesus will use the pronoun and the verb together, literally translated, I, I am the true vine. Forcibly stressing, I really am the authentic vine. Here, the word true meaning authentic. Point two is that God is the gardener. My father is the vine grower or gardener. The word that's actually used translates as farmer and it describes someone who worked the land and tilled the soil and it speaks of someone who wasn't in any sense an amateur. This is his full time job. True to his task, dedicated and professional. God, the gardener. Point three is that the disciples are the branches. I am the vine, you are the branches. Jesus tells the disciples that the only possible way for them to survive would be to be vitally, organically and personally linked to him. 
just as branches are joined to a tree. Eleven times in this chapter, Jesus uses the phrase, remain or abide in me. Eleven times. Live in me, stay in me. No matter how we translate the phrase, abide in me, 11 times is pretty convincing. With the departure of Judas and the knowledge that we have of what he went on to do, that he betrayed Jesus, we cannot miss the importance of this teaching. Abide in me. Stay true to me. Jesus is emphasising that there is no possibility of bearing fruit unless we remain in the vine. Apart from, separated from, cut off from Jesus, his disciples, his followers are helpless. Point four is the fruit of the vine. He lops off, removes every branch that doesn't produce fruit. But what is this fruit that Jesus is referring to? Some have suggested that the fruit is evangelism and winning others to the faith. But many of us are shy and reluctant to share our faith. And nowhere, nowhere in the Bible is it suggested that we might lose our faith and lose our life in Christ if we do not evangelise. So what is this fruit? It must be the opposite of the bad fruit described in Isaiah chapter 5 verses 1 to 30 known as the song of the unfruitful vineyard and if you have a moment it's really worth looking that up Isaiah chapter 5 verses 1 to 30 go and read that afterwards that song of the unfruitful vineyard for it talks of moral depravity spiritual blindness intellectual arrogance and political corruption. The rottenness that translates as stink fruit, fruit that is decaying and moulding away. In a way it is, in a way that it's all plain for everyone to see that kind of fruit. The kind of stink that really gets up your nose. Good fruit then is very simply, it is evidence of God in our lives. That's the good fruit. Evidence of God in our lives. And true disciples produce bountiful harvests of this fruit. And finally, Point five. This concerns the pruning and the cleaning experienced by the branches. The vine is encouraged to be fruitful by vigorous pruning. Jesus does not explain specifically what this pruning is. To the non-gardener, pruning can often appear to have gone too far. Sometimes there seems to be nothing left but the real gardener knows what he or she is doing and the following year the blooms and the growth are better than ever. Perhaps then we are to understand that God uses the pain and the sorrow and the sickness and the suffering, the loss, the bereavement, the disappointment and frustrated ambition that we may experience as a part of his pruning activity. 
When I think about this, I wonder if Peter remembered this bit of teaching. Peter, the disciple who fell into the pit of despond after having denied Jesus three times and yet went on to be the rock of the church. Did Peter remember this teaching, this conversation in this upper room? Perhaps that was a kind of pruning that Peter needed, that he needed for him to flourish. For when we truly abide in Christ, prayer will be answered. God is glorified and we will experience great joy. Horticulture helps us to understand the significance of what Jesus was saying. Most of us, even those who, of us who are not good at gardening, we know the importance of strong roots, nourishment and space to grow. Some of us also understand that when a branch is grafted on, the join eventually heals so that the sap flows in both directions and the newly grafted branch becomes part of the vine and the vine becomes part of the branch. We also know, don't we, that left to its own devices without some careful pruning, the vine will grow rapidly and wildly and it won't produce healthy fruit. So there's a lot, isn't there, in this passage for us to take away with us. A lot for us to think about. In a modern world that we live in today, filled with so many things to be passionate about, we may perhaps run the risk of pouring our time and our energy into things that divert our attention away from being true and fruitful branches of the vine. The teaching of Jesus is clear and it is simple. Abide in me. So I thank you for joining with me once again and I pray that the week ahead for you will indeed be a good one. It will be a week that is filled with promise, opportunities and those things that are life enhancing. So I look forward to seeing you again very soon. Take care of yourselves and God bless you.